Hello and welcome to Riemann Integral versus Lebesgue Integral. Often students ask me why we have two integral notions at all, or why we need the Lebesgue Integral when we already have the Riemann Integral. In this video I explain why we go from the classical integral definition, which is the Riemann Integral, to the more modern one, which is the Lebesgue Integral. However, let us first start with the Riemann Integral. Here we want to integrate a function f that starts from r and goes into r. So a normal function defined on the real line and with values in the real line. And as you should know, this integral is related to the calculation of an area below a graph. So let me do a rough drawing of this graph for the function f here and consider an interval on the real line. So maybe we start with a and go to b. Then we are talking about this area below the graph. So exactly this one. In short, this means the Riemann integral of the function f from the interval a, b is related to this area here. Therefore, we have the well-known idea to choose a partition of the x-axis and to approximate this area by choosing rectangles. And this approximation is known as the lower sum or the upper sum. So what I draw here is the well-known lower sum. And if we now choose finer and finer partitions, we call this limit of the lower or upper sums the Riemann integral if the limit is well defined. Well, this was a short summary of the Riemann integral and now we immediately find some problems here. These problems give us a reason to define another integral notion. Firstly, it is difficult to expand the Riemann integral to higher dimensions. Yes, you can expand it to higher dimensions, so it is possible, but it's very laborious. For example, if we would have a 2 here. This means that the x-axis here is now a two-dimensional space. So we can't use rectangles for the partition. Of course, we now could use cuboids. So if this is the two-dimensional space in the domain of definition, this R2, then our partition is now just rectangles in this plane. And our integral approximation now is given by cuboids. So maybe in this way. As you can see, it gets very technical and it will be much more work with this additional dimension. It's just one more dimension, but you have to do much more work. For example, to build the limit process in the end. This is directly clear if we consider the domain of definition here. In the one dimensional case, we only have an interval. So this is an easy thing since it starts with A and ends with B. It's just an interval. But even if we add only one dimension more, so here's the picture x1, x2 and f of x1, x2. So even if we just add one dimension, there are a lot of more possibilities. For example, the domain of definition for the function could be a circle in this plane. So let us focus on the domain of definition now. So I draw another picture, just the x1 and x2 axis. And then we find the circle just there. What we now want to do is choose a partition of the circle and put the cuboids above. However, of course, this is not exactly possible. So we can put rectangles inside the circle here. But as you can see, we even need a limit process to approximate the circle in the domain of definition. Again, I said it is feasible, but it's a lot more technical work. In summary, this is one problem of the Riemann integral we directly understand. It is much more work to do this in higher dimensions. The second problem of the Riemann integral, and what you should know from this one dimensional case, is that we need some continuity property for the functions we want to integrate. In other words, we have some dependence on continuity. We call that in the best case, the function we want to integrate should be continuous, then we don't have any problems. However, if we have discontinuity points, 
then there should be only finitely many of them. But if we have infinitely many, it can destroy the integrability of the function. I hope you know the typical example. So an easy function that you can't integrate using the Riemann integral. Hence the dependence here is indeed a disadvantage of the Riemann integral. Now the most important disadvantage of the Riemann integral is the relationship to limit processes. The question is here, in which situations is it allowed to interchange some limit processes? Or in other words, can I pull a limit sign inside the integral sign? So let me show this in an example. So we have to limit n to infinity and we integrate a function from a to b. So this is a sequence of functions fn and we integrate them with respect to x. The question is then, when is it allowed to pull or to push the limit inside the integral? So when does this equality hold? For the Riemann integral, we don't have many possibilities here. We always need the uniform convergence of this sequence of function. Only then we know that it is allowed to pull the limit inside the integral. However, this uniform convergence is a very strong notion and in some sense related to the continuity again. And therefore, we want to weaken this notion. Indeed, we have a lot of examples where there is no uniform convergence of the sequence of functions at all and we still have the same result on both sides. Hence, we know it should be possible to generalize this convergence theorem. However, not by using the Riemann integral. The Riemann integral is just not flexible enough to prove such a convergence theorem. Well, these are three important points that show the difficulties we may have when we use the Riemann integral. Most importantly, we have a wish to uh, the generalization to higher dimensions. So we want an integral notion that is not restricted to one dimension. So we don't want to do all the work again if we just change the space of the domain of definition here. We want an integral that works in every dimension the same. In order to understand this generalization, we need more technical details. Hence, I would suggest we start with the Riemann integral. Again, we do some sketch. So we have the x and the y axis. We also have a function where I draw the graph in green. So we have a function with values in the real numbers. For the Riemann integral, we now choose a partition of the x-axis as before, and now we can calculate the upper and the lower sum. Here I have drawn the lower sum, which means that we take the infimum in each subinterval for the height of the rectangles. And for the upper sum, we would take the supremum. So here, for example, this rectangle. Hence, we get the upper sum. If the difference between the upper and the lower sum can be made arbitrarily small for a finer partition, then we can define the Riemann integral. Then you can define it as the supremum of the lower sums or the infimum of the upper sums. This is then the same value. And this value is called the Riemann integral for the function f in the interval a, b. In order to do this, it was necessary that we have a function that goes from the real numbers inside the real numbers. Otherwise, we can't do the partition of the x-axis and we don't have a height here. The idea of the Lebesgue integral is now different. As you have seen before, it was very restrictive to find a partition of the domain of definition if it is not R itself. So if we, for example, have a three-dimensional space, then we can't find a partition easily. But we map still in the real numbers. So the right-hand side is still the same since we consider functions. So functions with values in the real numbers. So this is the same. The left-hand side is not the same. This means that the domain of definition, the left-hand side here, can be very high-dimensional or even very abstract. And therefore, we don't know what a meaningful partition of the left-hand side should be. 
just because we don't have these simple intervals in a high dimensional or abstract space. However, on the right hand side, we still find the real numbers, the one dimensional space of the real numbers. So instead of finding the partition of the x axis, it would be easier to just find the partition of the y axis. And indeed, this is what the Lebesgue integral does. Although this is not the way the Lebesgue integral is normally introduced. However, it is still a very good idea to visualize the Lebesgue integral. So let us draw the graph again. And keep in mind, the x-axis may be high dimensional or even abstract, but the y-axis is still the real line. And that is what we decompose now. Since this is only the real line, we can find the same interval partition as before. So we choose some values and define some intervals here. So this is the partition of the real line as we did before in the Riemann integral on the x-axis. So maybe we call these partition elements ci, where we in the Riemann integral we usually denote them by xi. Maybe as a reminder what we did in the Riemann integral was we defined an upper sum of some partition of the x-axis, so you would write u of the partition, and this is the sum of all the rectangles, which means a sum, and then you choose the supremum inside the interval times the length of the uh, interval, so times the length of your partition, so maybe delta xi. And you can do the same for the lower sum, then again we sum all the rectangles up, but each one is given by the infimum inside the given interval, infimum, uh, infimum of f of x times the length of the rectangle, so times the length of the interval there. So I call it delta xi. In this way, we usually define the Riemann integral. However, now we want to decompose the y-axis for getting the Lebesgue integral. Now we get the following picture. For example, this line here. So this value gives you this line here and this line here. Now we want to find all the parts of the function that lie between these two lines. So meaning inside this interval or in the real line. This means that we don't draw rectangles as before, but we look which part of the functions lie inside these two lines. Then we find here that we have one part on the left hand side. So we find all the arguments in x that lie in this set are sent to values inside this interval by the function f. And we also have here a part of the function. So we can project it again down to the x-axis and then we find, okay, all the arguments in x here are getting sent to the interval. Now these two parts are associated to the decomposition, the partition of the y-axis ci we shows. This is similar to the idea of the Riemann integral, but we immediately see that the decomposition of the x-axis below here is not connected. So we have different sets that are not connected in intervals as before. And this is the whole idea. Instead of choosing a fixed partition of the x-axis, we now choose a partition of the y-axis, of the values of the function. And then we get a useful partition of the x-axis that we can work with. Now the next question could be how to measure these lengths on the x-axis below. Therefore on the domain of definition, which is here uh, 3, but it could be some space, we need a so-called measure. We want to measure volumes in this space. This means that we want to measure the size of sets inside this space. So for example, if the space is R, we measure lengths. In R2, we would measure areas. In R3, it would be indeed, we measure volumes of sets. 
uh, but in abstract sense, we always speak of volumes. Hence, on the x-axis here, we could choose a general measure space. We just have to know how to measure the size of sets or the volume of sets, and such a measure space is usually denoted by omega. This means in the end we will have an integral that works on all functions that are defined on some measure space omega. Indeed, this is all we need to define the integral. Now you see how we could define an upper sum in some sense. So we take the ci here, and now I want the ci to be this one. So maybe I do a little picture. So the ci is this stripe here. So this would be an upper sum for the integral if we know the measure of the two sets together. Of course, these blue sets are just a pre-image of this interval under the function f. So maybe we just call it a. Now, if I call the measure we have here in our measure space just by mu, then we can calculate this generalized rectangle. It is ci, so the height, times the length on the bottom. This is the measure of our set a. Now we have one part of the whole integral, and now we can do this for the whole partition. So we have a finite sum over i. Of course, I should put an index i for a for the pre-image as well, and then we have a sum. And since we chose a finite partition of the y-axis, we have a finite sum here. And it is the upper sum or the lower sum, depending which ci we chose here. Then again, with some limit process with finer partitions, we will get the Lebesgue integral, and usually denoted by f d mu, since now it's depending on the measure we chose on the x-axis. Indeed, this construction now works for arbitrary measure spaces, since the x-axis doesn't need a partition anymore. We just need a partition of the axis that is r anyway. However, in this case, we really need the notion of a measure, even in one dimension. So here we know what the length of a subinterval is. It's just the difference between the right-hand side and the left-hand side. But here we need more. Or in other words, in the Riemann integral, we just measure lengths of intervals. But in the Lebesgue integral, we can have any fragmentation and we have to know the measure of this fragmentation. But if we know how to measure any set in the real line, then we have a very robust integral definition. Well, this generalizes the Riemann integral and eliminates all problems we had in higher dimensions, since this measure theory works in every dimension as you want. You just have to know how to measure volumes. And also, the dependence of the continuity is gone, since now we can measure the size of the set of the points of discontinuity. For example, if we have infinitely many points of discontinuity, but the measure of all the points, so the measure of the set of all the points is zero, we don't have a problem in the definition of the integral at all. And also for the last point, so these limit processes, we have good answers for. We will see that we have very good limit theorems that describe these limit processes for the Lebesgue integral. Even strong results for the one-dimensional case, but also in the general case of measure spaces. Okay, to sum it up, the Riemann integral is a classical notion. It may be easier to understand at the beginning level, but in the end, everyone wants to work with the Lebesgue integral. Thank you very much and see you next time.